All right, folks, welcome back to Crimson Cast. Scott here with you. Excited for this podcast today. Before we get going, just a quick shout out to two of our uh, friends. First off, we have Upland Brewery with the uh, Hoosier Game Day Lager. Uh, I got a couple uh, more cans of the Hoosier Game Day Lager filled up my fridge. Uh, if you listen to the last pod, you know I was drinking it on the patio, watching IU beat Northwestern. Um, so definitely check them out. They are at all Upland locations. You got a week off? Time to stock up, and then when we uh, pack the rock in two weeks against Nebraska, you can buy it at Memorial Stadium. Upland Brewing Company reminds you to drink responsibly. Go Hoosiers. And also our friends at Home Field Apparel. All kinds of good stuff. Um, they have the new Indiana script, like 90s throwover. The thing is awesome. Check them out. Uh, you can save 15% off your first purchase by using the promo code HOME23. So check out Home Field Apparel. All right, business time is over. We are excited to bring to our home and home. We're bringing Alex Bozich from inside the hall onto Crimson Cast podcast. I was on his podcast a couple weeks ago. So, Alex, welcome to welcome to our stadium, man. Thanks for coming over. Thanks for having me, man. As you know, I have the uh, utmost respect for you and Galen. You're the the pod fathers of uh, podcasts for Indiana University sports. You guys do a, a great job over uh, Crimson Cast and. You know, it's been awesome to see the um, the response that you've gotten to the football podcast this season because I, I know there's been a lot of long, dark years of podcasting about IU football, a lot of terrible seasons. So I, I, I'm happy for you guys that you actually have a good product to talk about. And I know it's exciting for you and Galen as well. So just wanted to put that out there. I know your listeners are thrilled. Uh, about it as well and, and i'm personally am just still that you guys are getting a legitimate football team to talk about this year i, I appreciate that it's definitely fun it, it's funny to hear you say that i've heard this from a lot of different people and it's we joke on the last pod it, it's almost like having a kid that's like graduating college you're like oh i'm so proud of you like he's walking like he's done so well for himself and it's like you put in so much time and effort and it's just almost like the, the the proud father at graduation as my kid is at least getting a. I wouldn't say it's valedictory, but at least like getting a diploma is where we're at right now. Yeah, they move up the rankings a little bit more. You could be talking about valedictorian, right? There's there's talk of um, being a contender for the for a playoff spot, which is incredible to think about. It's incredible. I think it's legitimate too. I mean, I think they've they've done it. It's it's funny. We started uh, Crimson Cast because we were both obviously big bat. I mean, went to IU, always a big bat, big basketball fans. We started right. At probably the nadir of Indiana basketball. Like, I think I have to go back and look. It was like the end of the Kelvin Sampson. I think right when Sampson was fired and we brought in Creens. Like, that's when we were like, this is the time. This is the time to strike. IU is hot. Um, and then within a year or two, you know, both Galen and I were going to football games or I had season tickets. He was working his way back and we both had, it was like, well, let's, let's talk. Like, no one's talking football. Let's start that. And um, it, it, it ended up become more of our brand than I thought it would be from starting this in kind of a, a basketball mode. Um, but no, it does feel like we're on the precipice of something, which got me thinking, have you thought about, you know, you have inside the hall. Have you thought about inside the rock? Like let's, let's get a, a, a subsequent page going, like just what you need and a whole other website to run. You know, it's funny. Somebody at IU, when Kevin Wilson got the job, talked to me and, and said, yeah. you know, we think you should start doing football stuff. And I, I just, my interest level in football is more from um i would call it more of a recreational interest um i'm not i'm not a diehard football person never have been i've you know i grew up in southern indiana and new albany and i was kind of you know in the middle of you know louisville kentucky indiana and it was always basketball for me and yeah. you know i i guess my formative years iu football wasn't really something that that drew a lot of attention and so it's harder for me to get inter interested in it. I will say that this year I have made it a point to, to watch the games. I was at a party with at some fr uh, friend's house over the weekend and made sure they had the IU Northwestern game on, was watching it. And um, so it's also nice for me to kind of be able to, you know, for basketball, you know, I'm, I go to some of the games, I'm on press row, I've got a press pass. Right. I can't really root for any outcome. You know, selfishly, I want them to do well for, the, the business but from a football perspective you know i'm not a member of the media so i can actually enjoy the success you know I, of of the program and it's it's been fun for that perspective but it would also kind of feel weird to just you know jump in now it's like you know you waited you know you had this website for 17 years and all right. of a sudden now you football is good you want to jump in like I, I don't 
I don't think people would uh, be running to read my thoughts on IU football. So uh, yeah, I'll I leave mean, it to guys like you and some of the other. You know what? Who's your huddles? One of them that's kind of been your huddle being uh, bite side bison. Taylor does a great job with his sub stack. Um, there's been a nice little, you know, we had punt John punt for quite a while. And those guys just, oh, yeah, kind of, I remember those guys. I just talked to those. I talked to those guys at one time. They were asking yeah. me like, they were super nice guys. I think they were just trying to figure out how to grow a following. And that was a long, long time ago. And I, you know, I tried to help them as much as I can. They were, they were out there towards the end of the Allen era, right? They kind of stopped doing stuff. They did. They, they've shut it down. Um, we had them on a couple weeks ago. Um, they shut it down about two or three years ago. Um, okay. Yeah. By the way, for those who are wondering, like this is actually this podcast is going to be a little bit different than the one Alex and I did because I figure the Venn diagram of people who listen to your pod and my pod is probably pretty similar. So I, I don't want to do just another let's preview IU basketball. At some point near the end, we'll talk about the upcoming season. I just I wanted to talk to you just kind of as another player in this sphere about these kinds of things. Just you know, starting a website, um, covering IU basketball all of these years, seventeen years. Um, so. You know, that's we'll kind of go back to the free flowing conversation. That's that's what this podcast is going to be. So people are like, sure. hey, what are they gonna talk about Balo? What are we gonna talk about the season? Like we'll we'll get to that at the end, but I also think we if you want that, I would go back and listen to the podcast that you and I did a couple of weeks ago on your feeds. I think we hit a lot of those topics. I will also say we're recording this Monday, October 7th. I'll probably save this and release it later on in the week, just kind of a dead period um with IU football not having a game this weekend. So if something wild happens like between now and then, and I, and I release it um, and we don't talk about it, that, that would be why. Um, so anyway, b- back to this, you know, you, you said inside the hall has been around 17 years. Like the first thing is just, I'm curious. And, and by the way, the, the respect goes both ways. I, I love what you guys do. I think you guys obviously are one of the first, you know, I don't say blogs out there, but websites doing it. You guys nailed the name, like just on naming is such a hard thing. You guys nailed it, but you've had, I've always thought the kind of the most um, like pointed view of Indiana basketball, like a very fair view of of what you're looking at. There's been a lot of other sites out there. I think some of them take either a way too positive view, a way too negative view. You you guys have felt like you've always been the most objective, I should say, um, about it. And you know, you kind of call it like you see it. So I, I've always appreciated that. But I'm just curious, you know, why why when you know. Tell us about like starting inside the hall and like why why did you decide to start that when you did? Yeah, how long do we have, Scott? Do we have? <laughs> We're cruising. Is, we, is... can go, we can go ninety minutes, two hours. It's yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll try to give the most concise version of this. Too. Yeah. So you know, I just kind of on my background a little bit. You know, I I started. I, I went to New Albany, which is obviously in southern Indiana. I started my college experience at IU Southeast, which is the regional campus down here and uh, went to IU then for a year and a half and then actually came back and finished up at IUS. So uh, kind of a disjointed path to a college degree. I did, gra- I did graduate in, f- in four years. Um, you know, I wasn't a big, I was a college basketball fan growing up. I wasn't a big, like necessarily IU fan. You know, I followed the program, but I, I, I just loved college basketball. I remember some of my earliest memories of, of watching IU games in the early '90s. I remember some of those teams were were great, fun, fun to watch teams. And I still remember, you know, the year Allen Henderson got hurt, and IU could have definitely uh, done some some damage had that not happened. But anyway, just kind of give you a little bit of background on on that. Obviously, my dad's been a sports writer for uh, a long time. Started out at the Louisville Courier Journal. I think it was maybe the Louisville Times at that point in the late '70s. And so I grew up in a house where. You know, we had the hoop scoop coming in the mail with the recruiting rankings. We had the sporting news coming in the mail. We had every morning I was reading the newspaper. So sports were always kind of just like ingrained in me from an early age. And I was more of also my dad's a huge White Sox fan. So I was a, a baseball fan, too. But sorry, for just this always year. had it. Right, sorry, yeah, exactly. Lost this horrible, year. <laughs> horrible. But anyway, you know, so I. um, I, I always was interested in sports and. um. But when I came, I got out of college, I graduated with a political science degree. I had no idea what I wanted to do. Like, I thought I wanted to go to law school. I didn't obviously end up doing that. And I I started working kind of nights and weekends um, at the Courier in Louisville, taking like high school scores. Like, they would call in the games and I would write a little blurb up. I was like just trying to break into the industry and would have any way to, to get involved because I, I love sports and 
um, I, I didn't necessarily want to do exactly what my dad was doing, but I, you know, right. I, I, was, I was interested in it. It was something to do. So I, I did that and I kind of saw like, you know, I followed Peeg. I, I knew Peegs before I started inside the hall because a friend of mine that uh, Matt Dennison down here in Southern Indiana that does a radio show was, was friends with Peegs. And so I'd met him a couple of times and I had a ton of respect for what he was doing and followed a lot of the other IE websites as well. But, you know, so, so I, ca- I come out of college and, um, I, I knew uh, Eamon Brennan a little bit, who was at yeah. IU, and Ryan Carraza, who's now still with me at Inside the Hall, through my sister, who went to IU and worked at the Daily Student with them. And, you know, I, I, as I just kind of watched what they were doing, they were blogging at other websites, and I was like, there's really no place like where there's just guys writing about IU basketball with maybe not with a press pass, but just like kind of giving their thoughts. And I'm like, this this is not a terrible idea to, to start this up and, and we'll see what happens. And that's kind of how the idea was was born. Um I reached out to them and we we kind of started talking about it and they, they were in. They, you know, they they were still young, interested and um wanted to do something like that. And we we talked um mostly via email, which I still have those emails and look through them from time to time. And uh, we started trying to come up with a name. I'll give Eamon credit. He did come up with inside the hall. So I always joke with him. Don't ask for any royalties now. It's been it's been too long. I'm, I'm keep we're keeping the name. Yeah, it's like the Nike. He yeah, he, he he obviously started it with us, the three of us, and he moved on pretty quickly because he was you know a superstar in the career. He went to ESPN. It was like, all right, we started inside the halls. Like, right, and then December tenth, December I think, or later in 2010, he wrote a post like, all right, guys, I can't I really I can't really dabble in this anymore. Like, I'm going to work for ESPN. I'm writing about college basketball. <laughs> so. We're stoked for him, obviously, but me and Ryan have kept at it, and it's been like a learning experience for me because I didn't really start it with the idea of like this is going to be my job or my business. There was a lot of you know there was three or four three or four years when we first started it and wrote everything, and I don't think earned any money from it. It was like just a hobby, and so it's it's grown into obviously a business, and um, some days it feels more like work than others, but. I still kind of go back to the fact that it was something uh, that I was just interested in and had a passion for sharing my thoughts on, on the subject. And I think that's in any business, that's kind of the best path you can take is, you know, try to do something that you have a passion about, passion about or are interested in. And, and usually it doesn't feel like work. Yeah. And it's, it's funny. We have, I, I feel wild saying this. We have younger listeners cause I don't feel old, but we're old. Sorry. But it's, uh, you know, it's it's weird to go back to those times when you're right. I mean, you know, outside of Peaks, there was just no place for anyone to go who was into IU basketball. And I kind of, you know, that's that's a little bit how Crimson Cast started. Gail and I had that background. But, you know, I was living, I moved to Houston out of college, and then I lived in St. Louis. And it was like, it was a struggle <laughs> to get information on IU basketball. You'd like search ESPN. And it's like, if we weren't ranked, it kind of sucked. It was like, damn, we're not going to be on TV no one's going to write about us. Like I had to have my parents send me stuff for the Herald times. And like they, their website was kind of okay. And it, 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 it's amazing to look back and think that, you know, now we live in a universe where it's like, well, of course this makes sense, but it's like, there was just nothing barely getting scores, let alone like, you know, recruiting updates or, you know, a big 10 perspective from an Indiana point of view that just didn't exist before, you know, 2009 or so. Yeah, I mean, there was Hutch was doing some stuff. I remember at the Indy yeah. Star, he had like a blog, but and there was at one time there was a there was a blog on like I think the Courier Journal's website had like a blog for IU for U of L and for UK that that they updated. Uh, but yeah, you're right. There wasn't a ton of um, other resources out there, and I, I didn't go into the idea it was like I'm going to compete with Peaks. Like I knew Peaks was already. And he'd been doing it since like 1998 or 99. It had a really dedicated following and I was friendly with him. I was, I, I always, it was always weird. Like when I first started it, cause I would see him at different things and I didn't want him to think I was like trying to like step on his sh- toes or anything. Or like I had, I, I have a ton of respect for him and you know, I, it's, I still see him from time to time at different uh, events. Like last year he came home for, or he came to a game at, in Bloomington and got a chance to talk to him. Like I, I just respected the hell out of what he did, like in terms of just building that community and everything. And I figured that the fan base was such that, you know, there was enough interest. If if we put our thoughts out there, we, we were just hopeful that somebody cared about what we had to say. And I feel like 
with anything, you have to like do it for a s- consistent period of time and show people that you're serious about it before they'll take you seriously. It's not like you can just r- start writing something and then like six months, all of a sudden you have a ton of followers, a ton of readers. It, it was a lot of time where we we're writing stuff probably that nobody read and but we just kept over it over a consistent period of time. And I think that's how you kind of build a following and build trust with your readers. That's, you know, the, the, the people always ask me like, you know, how do you build a following? And I'm like, Mm -hmm. you got to be consistent. Like you can't post like for Crimson Cash, right? I mean, if you posted three podcast episodes this week and then you didn't post another one until February, people would be like, where's the podcast like you're you're consistent like you you got to right. show people that you're you got some skin in the game so that to me was and it and still is like the, con- the consistency is a huge part of it no i agree and that's something i get asked that every so often too like you know how, how do you get into this and it's like well <laughs> like I, I think i'm very tangentially in but it's like you just you, you start doing it and like if you do you want to write about iu basketball or you want to do a podcast or a video cast or like whatever like start doing it like just there's nothing stopping and I, I'm with you do it. And I think the key is also like, there's probably going to be some lean years on the start. Like it's very, you know, we, we had, you know, I, our, our first couple of years, we were probably doing it just for Galen and I, like we actually found, um, we went back, I was going through my Google drive and I found the first like year or two of crimson cast audio. Um, and it's wild. It's just like, it is so wild to listen to it. And it's like, we're doing this just basically for ourselves and just kind of testing out and trying things. Um, I think the other thing that you said that I think is, I, I've always felt too, is, you know, pe- people ask like, you know, you know, somebody starts a new podcast, you feel competition. I'm like, no, like I, the more people in the space, if they're doing it with their own perspective and they have something there, like to me, it's like, I, I want more people in the space because it's great. You know, I love what you do. I love what we're doing. You know, there's, like the hysterics came in, they had a different viewpoint. And it's like, all right, that's, that's cool. Like I, the more people in is better. You know, we we're obviously big fans of like Taylor Lehman and bite size bison. Um, you know, he's looking at it from a different, you know, football from a much different perspective. You know, I think if you're just coming in trying to copy someone else, that's a little bit, but like, you know, if you come in and you have your own voice and you just start doing it and you, you're consistent, um, you know, that that's how you start. I found it interesting, you know, w- with all of these tools available, now it doesn't feel like there are more shows and websites popping up or maybe i'm just not searching it out enough i feel like little ones pop up here and there but for a fan base that's as devoted and for students who are as into it and have all of this stuff at their disposal i'm surprised there aren't 25 other websites like inside the hall or 30 more podcasts doing this not that i want more competition i just that's one thing that i've been interested in the last like 10 years is that there isn't a lot of other people out there doing it. It, I don't, I don't know. I just, I find that interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think now it, it's, I, I think the hard part is breaking in. And I think that you might, there might be things you never see because they were started and then somebody did it for a couple of weeks or a couple of months and then kind of gave yeah. up because they weren't getting a, gaining any traction. And it's harder now than it was when, you know, when you, started with crimson cast or when i started inside the hall it's a different completely i mean look how much the internet's changed over that period of time i mean it's twitter wasn't even we weren't even on twitter when inside the hall started or x whatever they're calling it now but i think that was i was looking i joined in 2009 i'm like i can't even really remember a time before that and there was actually a couple of years and it's just the way information is exchanged now is just completely different and it's going to continue to change. So that that's another thing is if you don't continue to evolve with the market, then someone else is going to, you know, pass you or take, take from your readers. And I agree with you. I'm not, I think the competition is a great thing because you give people an option of finding kind of what they, what they like and what they enjoy. And, you know, it, it helps make everybody else better, right? If it was just, if you were the only podcast talking about IU football or I was the only website or, you know, Ryan and I were running the only website that talked about IU basketball. It's like, how, how is that helping disseminate, you know, information to people? Because, you know, it's just one perspective. And I think it's good to have as many perspectives as possible. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun still, but it's also, it's just for me, the, the biggest challenge is like learning, the business side of things because when you start something like this you don't you do it as a hobby right and, and you're right. not think you didn't it wasn't like i was formally trained in like how to run a small business how to 
you know, organize that and all the other stuff that kind of comes with that uh, from that perspective are things that I'm like, that's not, I just want to write the, I just want to write stories and yeah. share my perspective. But now there's so many other things that come with it that I have to think about that. Uh, I'm still learning those things every day. Yeah. We, we never took that next step. <laughs> we kept it in hobby phase. Um, we we yeah. didn't go business. I, I'm curious early on, what was the process like getting press credentials from, from IU and talk about maybe some of your first experiences, like covering IU as part of the media. Cause that, that's something, you know, I, I think for what you guys were doing, obviously, you know, you, you wanted that access was going to make it, you know, you weren't just going to be like from a fan's perspective and just you, you want and having that access would definitely help. It's something I know for us, we just always kind of took the approach of like, I don't, I don't think that helps us at all. And I think, it'll, you know, we can be a little bit probably, I don't think it affects your judgmental ability, but I, I just, I don't know. Something just, we just never went down that road. So I'm just curious what that process was like early on when you're just like a website who's writing stuff and, you know, you go to IU and they're like, what, what the hell are you talking about? I'm assuming they were probably like a little bit dismissive from the get-go. Well, it was, you know, when we started out, we didn't use our real names. Like we had nicknames that we right. wrote on the site and so that was like the first two and a half three years and we, we finally got to the point where i think i got to the point where like i wanted to start going to some stuff like going to games and so i don't remember if it was jd campbell reached out to me or i reached out to him but to this day you know jd has obviously moved on from iu but right we still talk like this is a relationship that was built over a long period of time and uh in many ways jd was so so helpful for me in terms of just kind of getting me in the door there and he was very receptive of what we were trying to do like once he knew who we were and what we were what we were about and what we were trying to do he was very receptive of what we were doing and was well uh, to give us credentials and so it wasn't like a there wasn't ever a time it was like i you was going to say no you, you're not welcome here you can't come so right. i think i think putting our names on everything kind of helped kind of solidify our legitimacy and then once we did that we started to to cover games and and, and then obviously you know, with me not living in Bloomington, I think really the thing that helped us um, was being able to, and Galen helped a lot with this and still does now from time to time with like helping us identify students at IU that could work with us. Because obviously I'm not going to be, there was a time when I went to every game and right. uh, that, that's got old after a while, like a lot of driving, driving home at 2 a.m. Um, yep. And so we've got students on the ground there in Bloomington that are uh, doing a lot of the game coverage and, and being at press conferences after games and things like that now that, that really help out from that perspective. But no, they were, IU was great. Um, you know, Fred Glass was always super nice to, to me and had him on the podcast a couple of years ago. Dolson's been on the podcast and it's always nice and friendly. And, and obviously JD and another SID now, Charlie Duffy, and Jeff Keg, they've always been super accommodating. So I think they've been, you know, I, I can say, they were far more welcoming than a lot of like the schools that we like, we try to go cover road games for. I can, I can tell you yeah. a story one time from it was the Oladipo Zeller season where they were number one for a lot of the year. So the 2000, what, 12, 13 year. Yep. And, and we, I was pretty, we were pretty deep into coverage by that point. Like we had a established following yeah. and we were, we were, um, I was a member of the basketball writers association and I had, you know, other people vouching on my behalf, but Ohio state for some reason didn't want to let us co cover the game there. And so, um, cream found out about it and he was like, he couldn't believe like that. They didn't want to let me in. And so he somehow working with JD, um, JD was like, we're, we're going to get you in just, don't worry about it. It's not, not a big deal. So I show up at the arena and I, I, I send him a text or whatever. So he sends somebody up there with like this, this ticket and I'm sitting like directly behind the bench <laughs> with my laptop right there. Yeah. Like, you bet. Th th yeah. This is like, I'm like, JD, this is like, I remember somebody sent a screen grab like from TV yeah. and like, what are you doing behind the bench? Like I'm sitting there next to Marnie Mooney, who was like the, yep at that time the director of like the academic and like, all the parents and stuff were behind me and i'm like on my laptop right there like trying to like do things and i'm like this is great like great seat like i'm, I'm in the building but i'm thinking to myself how am i going to get in the press conference like right how's this going to work and so they handed me this pass it was like this you know whatever 
uh, all access type thing. And I, and I went in the media room after the game and filmed the filmed the press conference. And so that was that was like the only time I can remember like that somebody didn't like want to let us in. But other than that, I feel like there was a process at one point, like from the Basketball Writers Association, where they kind of saw where websites were going and they made this task force to identify websites that were in their eyes legitimate in terms of being right. being able to get credentials and we were we went through a vetting process and us and there was and a, and a um hoops which is a michigan site that we're yep. really close with uh, they were on the list and some other websites and so once the basketball writers association published this lit this list anytime somebody kind of gave pushback on credentials it was like i kind of was able to point to that and say hey like we're not just some fly by night site that just popped up like we're actually trying to cover the team in a legitimate way and you know we're we are a website but i think it took a lot of time for people just to kind of understand like that it was for a long time it was like we don't credential websites certain places like ohio state was like we don't right. credential websites and they've let us in since it's, it's no big it's no big deal but that was you know 11 years ago so i will say from an ie perspective though they, they were kind of one of the first schools that really kind of looked at websites as something that was legitimate and uh, they they let a t- they let a ton of them in to this day, and they they they've been pretty cool with with credentials and everything. And like I said, they've they've always been willing to to work with us and be accommodating, which I really appreciate. Yeah, no, I know. Like coach with uh, assembly call goes goes to games on a credential pass, and I think it's I, I, I it's I think it's good, and like it, I think it shows that the universities are understanding the the changing media landscape. I, I'm curious from your perspective, having done this for so long with the IU fan base, what what drives the most traffic on the site? I mean, obviously, when when the team is good, like that twenty you know twenty twelve thirteen season, I know traffic was probably up. But I'm just curious, like, is it pregame, postgame? Is it recruiting? Is it postseason? Like, what 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 do you know? You know, really drives traffic when you're going to put it up there. Well, winning is number one. Like, yeah, a successful season that's number one. There, I always think to myself, like, I've been doing this since two thousand seven. And I use been to what three Sweet Sixteens in that standpoint. They've not been like to the Elite Eight at all. They've never right. been to the Final Four. I'm thinking, what could this be like if they actually were competing for Final Fours or winning the Big Ten regularly? It could be a lot different. And I think it's a testament to the IU fan base that I've been able to do this for so long, despite the relative lack of success for the program, yeah. because it just shows that th- these fans are gonna support the program unconditionally things could be you know as bad as they were under archie miller for those four years and people are still uh supporting the program you know coaching search obviously is up there too i remember when they got rid of archie i i I remember actually this is when they got rid of crean there was like three or four days where our server was just completely like messed up like we we couldn't do anything and there was like nothing we could do because it was like every time they tried to change fix something or change something the avalanche of traffic just kept coming in and that was before we kind of had the technology side of it figured out a little bit more so there was nothing we can do um from that same point we just kind of had to let it let it die down a little bit and and stabilize things that it's that was a big thing that, Re- that was one of the highest stretches we ever had too i mean galen went on like a podcast tear he had like five in a row but I, I think at that point, the Crean firing, this is back when iTunes used to have like a ranking. And I think we made like Crimson Cast was in like the top five for college athletic, like just sports podcasts. Like it was wild. Our numbers just blew off the roof. Um, so yeah, coaching searches yeah. definitely do. And that, that Crean one, for whatever reason, really, really lit things up. Yeah, I remember oh. driving down to Georgia Tech for that NIT game and then driving back and I'm thinking, When's this gonna happen? Like, I gotta make sure I get home before I. This can't happen while I'm somewhere <laughs> along 65 in Tennessee. We can't have. Some, right. And luckily, I made it home, and I think it was like a day later that that, that happened. And then it was like, anyway. we should have been in assembly hall. Yeah, that was the, that. Oh, man, that was weird. That was weird going to that press conference with Crean afterward, and people were asking him questions. And he, I don't think he fully knew for sure what was gonna happen, but you could just tell like his demeanor and his. The way he talked about it, he, he was very concerned like about his future. But you know, getting back to your your question, just in terms of what drives interest, recruiting still to an extent, but I think recruiting, like traditional recruiting, has changed. Like the portal this past 
off season was huge. Like it was yeah. some of the best traffic we've ever gotten. And now obviously you'll get like small bumps for things like Trent Sisley committing. And I think Braylon Mullins coming up will be a pretty big deal regardless of, of where he goes. But I just think the recruiting coverage in general has changed that people are more now, I think invested and excited about the portal, which is just kind of weird. Like it used to, when the season ended in late March, things used to die down pretty quickly. And I think this year, like through like the end of May, things were pretty um, hot and heavy in terms of the traffic that we were getting. So that, 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 that's obviously a big one. And then obviously when, when there's things like, you know, NCA investigations or bad news, things like that yeah. also kind of drive you know, negativity. Uh, also, unfortunately, drives clicks. I mean, when they had that accident, you know, like in what was it, 2015 or 16, I don't, 2014 maybe with the Devin Davis thing. I oh, remember yeah, that yeah. being a, a big thing. And, um, but overall, I think the number one thing is just winning. Like when I use good and the team's winning a lot of games, which I think everybody's hopeful for, that's going to be the case this year. I think it could be good for everybody involved podcasts websites social media followings all that i agree you talk about recruiting is there one recruit over the years that you wish we would we would have gotten gary harris i would say okay that, that was that's probably the one that i look at and say i don't know how much he would have changed things for that one season but because they already had Old Depot, obviously, but just imagine him on that team with Yogi and Old Depot, Zeller, Watford, Sheehy. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah. what if he's your sixth man? I mean, he's. I thought yeah. he was just yeah. a tremendous player as a high school high school player, and you look at the rest of that recruiting class. It was largely, I mean, it was talked about as like the movement, but it was largely a bust everywhere else. Yeah. I mean, Perea was a guy that I thought was going to be really good just from seeing him in AAU with the tools, but it never really worked out. Uh, Peter Jerkin clearly didn't have a big role. Ron Patterson signed and then never really, I don't think, I don't think he lasted through the first summer. I think he went yeah. to like prep school after yeah. that. And then Jeremy Hollowell was another guy that had to go elsewhere and to find like his role in college and didn't play a huge role. I think two years he spent in Bloomington. So that to me Looking back at that class, but but yeah, just think about Gary Harris and, and Yogi for multiple years in Bloomington. That would have been a lot of fun. So that that probably be the one I look at, at least since I've been covering the team. That oh, I guess the one that kind of got away. How about that's, you? Is there any do you look at? One. Um, it's a little bit before both of our times, but I and I don't. I mean, this is the 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 reporting wasn't quite the same back then, but just Greg Oden still kills me. I mean, that probably keeps Mike Davis here for a while. So that's a whole nother, like, how does that roll out? But you know, the, the, the rumor always was that, you know, he just wouldn't recruit Davis, wouldn't recruit Mike Conley, which is funny. Cause like Mike Conley's still playing in the NBA. In the NBA right. Was, was, I mean, and it's not like he sucked in college either. I mean, he was a huge part of that, but it's, you know, you, you look at those teams. I mean, I think that was like, it would have been with like Marco Killingsworth. And I, I'm not sure who else is on those like teams that it would have been, but you know, that was an Ohio State program that was kind of just going along, and then like they add those two dudes, and it's like they're in the Final Four, just like that. Like it just happened. So, right. um, that's one that always hurt. And then it, this is very personal for me. Um, you know, with football, there was right when my wife and I moved back, pretty shortly thereafter, Demarlo Belcher was a wide receiver for football who went to uh, Northside, where my, my wife went to high school up in Fort Wayne. So that was always like really cool to root for a player who went to her high school. Um, as I've mentioned many times, my wife is a teacher at Westfield up here. Um, you know, she had Braden Smith in class and it's like, he's right up here. I'm watching him play high school basketball. Like it's Westfield. And I, I think he's also a great player to watch and like embodies everything. And then just like, not only doesn't go to IU goes to Purdue. Like it's just, it sucks all the way around. Like I think Braden is awesome. I don't think he's a program changing player, like maybe Harris or Odin is, but it's, it's very personal to me that it's just, and it's still going on that it's like, damn it, that would have been perfect to have him, somebody I could root for, and it's not. And then seeing all, everybody around here being huge Purdue fans, as they, like, Braden, as they should be fans of Braden Smith because we live in Westfield, and he's a great example of, of you know, what we produce, but it's like, but there weren't Purdue stuff. So that one's it. That one is continuing to hurt, Alex. Did you see him at all in high school? I watched him like, a little bit, yeah. What do you think? 
Uh, I thought he was a good play. I mean, I thought he was a good. I didn't see this. Um, I, I didn't think this was going to happen. I thought he was good. Yeah, I mean, I thought he was really good. I couldn't understand why Archie wasn't on him more. I I, I would it agree. Didn't, it didn't make a lot of sense to me. Like yeah. based on Not some of the guys that they went after. I heard he was he he you know his his family was was fans of IU and I think he would as would have been very receptive to any kind of recruiting. But my understanding is he wasn't even got a sniff from Archie. Um, another one, another one that just popped into my head was Kyle yeah. Guy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because everything you heard with him was like he was receptive to IU too, and I know they recruited him and offered him, but it was almost like they didn't go 110 percent after him. Yeah. And then he goes on to Virginia and look at the success they had, wins a national championship. So. As we talk about him. this, it leads to another question. Um, something that you now me and other friends talk about when we get deep in IU basketball. Something Gail and I used to talk about a lot more. But I'm just curious to ask you, like, do, and I have my answer to this question, but I will obviously ask you first you look at all these other programs you know ucla U north carolina kentucky teams that you know were blue bloods or still blue bloods or teams that kind of have gone up and down you know do, do you think there's anything inherent holding indiana back from being elite or do you think but I'll, I'll leave it there like do you think there's anything and what would it be that's holding indiana back from getting back to an elite program wow it's a tough question. I, I'm not thought about it in depth, but like off the top of my head, I think what you see at some of the other programs is maybe less patience in terms of when things go poorly. Um, so I look back at North Carolina when was it Darty was there for a couple of years and it was it was like Darty bottomed out two years, yeah. years, right. I think he bottom, bottomed out like pretty quickly. And I was like, all right, this isn't going to work. We got to make sure we go get the guy. I I think I think they've actually not done a terrible job with the hires in terms of who the coaches are. Going back to Samson, he was a really good coach, obviously a proven guy that went to a Final Four at Oklahoma. And now look at what he's doing at Houston. You kind of look at that and say, man, if he could have just kept off the – three-way calls what what could he have built in bloomington i know there was some off the court stuff but he was actually a pretty solid hire tom cream when they hired him he, he'd gone to a final four at marquette he had Dwayne wade and cream had some really high moments but there was just not the consistency archie miller looked like a, a slam dunk to everybody um he was the the hot name in the coaching uh, carousel that season and you look at that coaching cycle if you would have told me archie was going to be the worst of the three Big Ten hires that year, which were Chris Holtman, Brad Underwood, and Archie. I would have told you probably you were crazy, but Brad yep. Underwood now, to me, is the top three, four coach in the Big Ten. Holtman was really good early at Ohio State and made a lot of NCAA tournaments, but again, they didn't, that wasn't good enough, so they made a move with him, and now he's at DePaul, and then Archie obviously got four years in Indiana, never makes the tournament. So I don't necessarily think there's anything holding um, them back, but I, I do think like, you've got to have the right hire at the right time. And I don't necessarily think they've had that with, with Woodson, you know, I, I think a lot of people, I think maybe he thinks based on, I, I listened to an interview with him uh, over the weekend that he did up at uh, big 10 media day with CBS sports. I'm not sure if you listened yeah. to it. Yeah. It was a Matt Norlander. It was like 11 or 12 minutes. It's on YouTube. If you've not watched it, check it out. But he, he at, was asked like a couple of questions and he like brought up the fans in the media, like you know, criticism a little bit. And it's like, you know, I, I remember like after Woodson's first couple of years, I was just like super complimentary of him from the standpoint of, you know, bringing in uh, the pieces that he did going to the tournament for two straight years, retaining trace Jackson Davis, you know, making, you know, the tournament to me was a big deal over, over two years. And then, Last year was a step back, and I think a lot of us like basically acknowledged that it, it wasn't the, the results that Indiana should have had, and they should have been a much better team. So I think this is very much like a year where he's going to have to prove a lot of things to a lot of people. I think there, people are optimistic in terms of just the, the program and um, the pieces on the team, but I think, I think there's a lot of people who want to see you know a much better product this year. So 
kind of not not to go on a tangent here, but I don't think there's an, anything inherently holding IU back. I just think it's all about getting the right coach at the right time, and I don't necessarily. I mean, they, they've had they've made some what looked like at the time solid hires, but you know, Billy Gillespie also looked like a really good hire at Kentucky until he wasn't, and there's countless other examples of, of coaches who, I mean, you would have told me after Chris Holtman's first couple of years at Ohio State that he'd now be coaching at DePaul. I would have told you you're crazy. So it's uh, it's hard. You know, these everyone wants to kind of go um, play revisionist history and say, well, they should have hired this guy or they should have brought in this guy at that time. But I, I can't look at any of the hires that they made. Um, you know, Woodson – was interesting just because I don't think anybody saw that one coming, but at least you could see from the standpoint of he, you know, he went to IU and they had gone outside the family for what the last three hires before, prior to that. And they wanted to get an IU guy. And I, I don't think a lot of people had a strong appetite for bringing in Steve Alford. And uh, there was, uh, he was probably the, the, the next logical candidate beyond that. And like I said, it done, done well, did well his first two years. I think he took a step back last year and, um, he's got a lot to prove, at least from a wins and losses perspective this year. But I think he knows that, and I think the team's going to be much better. But I don't, I don't know that anything's holding them back per se. I think it's you know, if you had the right coach at the right time, I think there's nothing uh, stopping Indiana from getting back to that you know top five, top ten program status. Yeah, I I agree with you. I mean, so real quick, back check. It's Matt Dor. We we screwed up. Matt Doherty with North Carolina. But I, I always look at Matt Doherty and Gillespie. You, you mentioned those two guys because it's funny because you, you people look back. It's like, well, they sucked. And like, you know, North Carolina and Kentucky don't screw around. They make changes. It's even more than that. I mean, you look at Doherty at North Carolina. He went 8-20. and 20. His second year, he was 19-16. and 16. Um, Then he went 4-12 and 12 in the ACC, 6-10. and 10. But he was showing improvement. Um, it's not like they were awful. They went to the NIT his second year. And it's like, not good enough. He's out. Gillespie had two years at Kentucky. He was 18 and 13 and 22 and 14. He was 12 and four in the SEC his first year and then eight and eight his second year. So a little bit back, but still 22 and 14 his second year. And it's like, that's not good enough. Um, and I think it's, you know, people sometimes give Indiana this credit of like, oh, their fans are unreasonable. They don't give enough time. It's like, I, I think sometimes we give too much time. And I'm, I'm not speaking about current coaching at all. I just, I think when you look at, it's more of a longer term discussion. You look at Archie or what we did with Crean or even Davis. You know, we, I, I don't think we are an unreasonable fan base. I, I think you look at some of those where it's like, man, 22 14, 8 and 8 in the conference with Kentucky, that's, that's pretty good. I mean, and then they just, they're like, we're done. That's two years when he was the hottest coaching prospect. Um, but I, I agree a million percent with you. I don't think there's anything holding IU back. And what I've always said is it does, you know, when when you have the right hire at the right time at the right place, things just click. Um, and I, I think, honestly, that's where I would say maybe IU just needs to be a little, and again, I'm not speaking toward this year at all. I just think at a high level, they probably need to be a little less patient and a little more aggressive with what they do because, you know, the, the Archie thing to me, again, is a great viewpoint. Like if Indiana would have hired Underwood, it would have been like you picked the wrong guy. <laughs> like that was the third option of the three coaches, and you know, in the end, you want to pick the best player. But there is a piece as an AD where you have to kind of understand that you're you're playing a political game here too. So if you're going to, you know, it's a fantasy example here. If you're like playing fantasy football, it's like if you don't take Christian McCaffrey first this year, like you better know what the heck you better nail that pick, or else everyone's going to rail on you. And even then, they'll still make fun of you. Um, and you know, same thing with drafting in the, in the pros, sometimes you just have to take guys because it's like, I, I look stupid if I don't take this guy, even if I think he's not the best pick, um, long story sh short said, it's like, it's really hard to know how to hire the best coach in a cycle. Sometimes you pick a cycle and like, you look at that Archie, you know, the, the, the Archie, uh, uh, Underwood and, um, Holtman cycle. It's like, there wasn't. Maybe Underwood will get there, but it's not like there was a, you know, a Bobby Hurley in there or, you know, Danny Hurley in there. Like there wasn't right. a generational coach there. Um, I, I look at this more as like you just maybe as a as a staff just need to be more aggressive and like we just need to take more shots and get more at bats and just have more. Sh and, you know, 
again, you just look at other programs, they maybe have a shorter hook than we do. And maybe that is what is slightly holding us back. And again, I don't, I'm not saying anything about Woodson this year or even next year's. I just, I think that that might be, you know, sometimes maybe you get a little too complacent and just like, we got to give this more time, more time. It's like, if you get it right, it doesn't, you know, it's going to be right. I think it's really hard to figure out who's going to be a good coach. Um, and so to me, it's like the way to solve that is you just take a bunch more cracks at the apple because it's really hard to tell. I don't know. Yeah. The other thing I think like right now with IU and specifically, I think that it's kind of a double-edged sword from the standpoint of realistically, if you have to make a, and I'm not, I'm not saying anyway, there's going to be a change anytime right. soon, because I think there's a really good chance that Mike Woodson has a great year and this, discussion is completely gone but you know pe people that people that really pushed last spring for a change like in the fan base i looked at what happened at louisville and kentucky in terms of what they were able to hire and i said would indiana fans have actually been happy with either of those hires i think people would have been complaining about both of those hires because pat kelsey and mark pope i believe have combined for a grand total of zero ncaa tournament wins now yeah. you think about this would you ever believe that Louisville and Kentucky would have to go into a hiring process and end up with a coach that had zero NCAA tournament success? Yeah. Do you think Indiana fans, when there's a, whether it's, you know, a year from now or five years from now, when Mike Woodson retires, do you think they're going to be happy with a hiring a coach that's never won an NCAA tournament game? It, it's, it's just different. I mean, well, and I, guess, what, I guess that would be, if I had to say what is holding Indiana back, that might be it is they're in this kind of weird no man's land of they're, they're like an elite team, but they're not really able to hire there. And, and what I mean is like, you look at what we'll take it to IU football. You look at what Signetti is doing with IU football. And it's like, dude, this is a home run hire. But again, going back to my, like, you also have to win the press conference a little bit. If you're the AD, like in the off season, there's no way Alabama could have hired Signetti. Like it's just I mean, right. he would, he had Alabama ties. Like if they would have hired Signetti, that place would Tuscaloosa would have gone nuts. Like are you insane? This guy JMU. Like it would not have worked. I mean, Kalen DeBoer is a fantastic hire. I think they only were able to hire him because he took Washington in the national championship game. I mean, if if Washington kind of shits out middle of the year and doesn't make the college football playoff, you know, you're talking about two losses for Washington last year that let's just add two losses to their schedule. It's like, that's still a really good year for Washington. I don't think Alabama could have hired DeBoer as a team. And so you're, I, I do wonder if Indiana is kind of stuck in this spot where they're not able to take a shot at like, you know, I think it was the year before we went for Archie, you know, Nate Oates was available at Buffalo. It's like, I don't know if Indiana fans at that time would have been like, the hell are we doing? Like we're, so I don't, that, that might be, that might be, we might be getting to our answer here is that could be part of the problem is that, you know, some of these smaller schools like Alabama in basketball, they're able to take a shot. It's like, what do we have to lose? Like, let's, let's just kind of keep rolling the dice. Um, and sometimes, you know, the, the guys like Signetti or Nate Oates are the ones that, you know, no other high level team would have taken them. So they're able to make these runs at places that, you know, were able to kind of take a, a shot. I don't know. The other thing is, these coaches can stay where they are, win as just as many games, and not deal with the scrutiny that they would deal with at IU, right? Like a Scott Drew, for example, he turned on Kentucky. He's at Baylor. He's won a national championship there. They've gave him they gave him a new arena. They've upgraded his practice facilities. He's got all the money he wants. He's basically the mayor of that area. He can do whatever he wants from you know resources perspective. I'm sure he's got whatever NIL he needs. Why would he want the aggravation of going to Kentucky or Indiana or Louisville when he can just stay at Baylor and win as many games? Same thing with, I mean, Hurley's a little bit different, but I think a lot of people, if you would have told people at the end of the season that the Lakers and Kentucky were going to make a run at Hurley and he'd basically be like no to both, I mean, that's what other basketball coaching jobs are more hope, high profile than, than those. And, and he turned those down because he realizes, you know, I can do everything I want to do from a wins and losses perspective there's not as much pressure on me at this place. And I do think there's a probably you have to have the right mindset to take the Indiana job. And I mean that in the way of you're going to be 
the most recognizable figure in many ways in the entire state. You're going to be every move you make, you know, every recruit you don't get, every game you lose, it's going to be talked about on a podcast like this, or it's going to be written about on a website or social media. You got to be pretty thick skinned. Like you can't yeah. worry about what's being said on the outside. And, and that maybe that's not everybody. I mean, I, I think that was one of the problems with, you know, it would have been fine for Archie if he would have won ever, more. I think he would have been completely fine, but I don't think he understood when he came in, like what the job was like from a responsibilities, like with the fan base and engaging the fan base and the media responsibilities. And I can remember like times when I saw him out at like high school games and stuff. And he like com- looked like completely like, I don't want to say annoyed, but just uncomfortable that people like even wanted to come up and talk to him or take a picture. It's like, man, cream, he was eating that stuff up. He was like hugging right. people and taking pictures of that. Like he understood that part of it. So it's just a really complex job too, from that standpoint, because there's these crazy expectations, which I think is great. The minute Indiana basketball loses its expectations is the minute, you know, that it's going to go even further down the, the pegging order where it already is. Like right now I'd say you look at Ken Palm, uh, I think it's like a top 25 job, which is still pretty good. Yeah. which I think we all believe it should be a top 10 job just based on performance. Uh, I'm not saying job, but performance right. since the Ken yeah. Palm era, that's where they're ranked. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's just a really, it's just one of those jobs where you got to have the right person. And I, I'd say there's only a handful of those in the country where um, finding them writing, right ingredients and mixing them all together and finding the right person is not easy to do. And, You've also still got, you know, a large portion of the fan base that's grew up watching Indiana be dominant in the 70s and the 80s and into the early 90s. And those people are still hoping and wishing that Indiana can get back to that. And I think those are expectations that are unlikely to be the the run that Knight had in Bloomington and what he did. I just I don't know that there's anybody you can hire and be able to do that because look at all the big 10 titles he won winning three national championships. It's a different era now college basketball. So I think the thing that Indiana needs to get back to is just, we talked about this a little bit on the, on the podcast, on the brink episode is get to the tournament every year and give yourself chances to advance. Like that's where what's missing is they've just not been at the table enough. I mean, you're not going to, if you're not sitting at the table, you're not going to get fed. Right. I mean, you got to get there and they've not gotten there uh, nearly enough. uh, The thing with Knight is and basketball was wildly different at that point, but you had, you know, branch McCracken, you had the years with, you know, two titles, Indiana basketball had also fallen off at that point as well. And I think they were at that point where they were willing to take a shot at a young up and coming coach in Knight. You know, I don't, and again, this is obviously way, way before my time, but it's, it's almost like, the, the the seas leveled where it's like, all right, you know, they realized the time, like, all right, we're not the same program we were before. We can't get the best. I don't say bet. Like we're willing to take a real gamble here on a guy. And that's, that was, you mentioned the run night had, like that was always the, when, when he passed away and we did some kind of retro about a year ago, almost did some retrospectives. Like the thing that I was amazed by was, I mean, I kind of knew this, but really looking at it, just how effing young he was. I mean, just, he was so young and, you know, everyone saw, you know, he was, I think, you know, he he won his second or third title before anybody else had ever won, like, one. I mean, he was, like, 35, and, you know, he, he looked older as a younger person. I think he was only, like, 46, like, my age when he won in 87. I mean, it was it, it was wild, just insane how young he was. And I think he was 29. I'm doing this all off memory, but, you know, right around there when they hired him. Like, again, it's like, I think Indiana had gotten to that point where they were willing to take a risk, and maybe that's you know, we as a fan base, if and when we have a new coaching search at some point, maybe we have to be willing to like, look, let's, let's take that risk, but knowing that it may not work either. Um, Right. All right. I'm going to go off this. We'll kind of wrap up with, with this, you know, changing IU. There's always been talk about, you know, the, the, the silly things, uh, the traditions and stuff. I don't think any of that stuff matters for like the program, like, you know, doing any kind of change or anything would, would get us a title. But I'm curious, what's one tradition you wouldn't never change with Indiana basketball and one tradition that you're totally fine changing? Because I, I, have, I, have, I have a couple answers on this, 
I'm, I'm asking you blinds. So I didn't give you time to think about it, and I'm happy to go first if you want time to think too. I would say the one that I wouldn't want to change would just be the the candy stripe pants because I think it's something that people um, associate directly with the program, and you know, you see kids and you see. I've seen kids as little as three or four years old, and I've seen like grandfathers and yep. wearing those at the games. Like it's something that everybody like looks at at Indiana basketball and says like this is what it, other other fan bases like like to make fun of it, which is like that's my reason for like keep yep. it right. Like it bothers other people; they get mad about like the candy stripe, like it looks so stupid or whatever. And I'm like, it's Indiana's thing; like keep it; it's fine. Like the thing I was, and this could be controversial. The thing that I don't really care too much about seeing change would be having names on the back of the jerseys because I, I just don't like I, I I don't think it's as big of a deal maybe as some people make it out to be um it's always like well we play for the name on the front which is true but that doesn't mean you can't have a name on the back of the jersey and now with the Nil I mean imagine <laughs> excuse me they I know they've tried to sell like some jersey I, I wasn't Bloomington a couple of years ago and I saw I think it was like a Hudgefino like jersey that they had for sale at this Kirkwood place and it looked like terrible because it wasn't like a actual jersey like I know like, I see those somebody, around like somebody, I see Isaiah Thomas jerseys like that that doesn't exist that wasn't real right right so <laughs> I, I I wouldn't have a problem with it I mean I know a lot of people would probably disagree but um I, I just I think times change from uh some of some things change and a lot of programs there's probably a couple other ones that don't have the names in the back of the jersey but they're few and far between and i, I just wouldn't have a problem uh, maybe you 110 percent disagree with me but I, I just i wouldn't have a problem with that changing no it's i mean it's more fun if we completely disagree but we don't those are my exact i, I have a couple other things that i'll change that i'll get to i completely agree i think you know when i went to iu you know i, I mentioned this i did some media at iu and like it was wild how uncoordinated IU was at the time but basketball was like its own they had their own script logo they had their own you know trident logo they, they just they had everything on their own and everyone else had a different they had different colors I mean at that time you know football was doing the oval and the black but literally there was different variants of the IU trident across all sports but basketball like had their own the kind of the rounded version was like that was theirs they had their own shades of colors it was wild but you also you know looking back the candy stripe was just basketball. That's all it was. Now, I and I love to see how IU has kind of taken it, marketing it in a lot of other sports. I know swimming and diving always had the candy stripes too, so I, I, I rephrase that for a sec. But like now you see it, you know, in football, like er, all the sports kind of take the candy stripe as, as, as an Indiana thing. I think it's great. So I agree with you. Like that would be the one thing I don't think you ever change because it's a great marketing. It's a great differentiator. I agree with you on the names in the jersey, especially in the NIL era. It's it's a bit of a bygone era. It it harkens to that was a that was really a night thing. And you know, Knight had his time and he was great, but we've we've moved on. Not moved on is the wrong thing, but it's like it's just it's a different era. Um I, I don't know if you have to have jer names in the jerseys on all games, but I, I also think kind of like I'm cool with monkeying with the jerseys a lot more. I mean, in the in this world of secondary and alternative jerseys and the being a cool thing and having you know sales opportunity for that this is partially our i think our deal with adidas i don't think they treat us like a high level program so we get kind of garbage stuff but i've always been really unimpressed with our secondary and you know uniforms the times we change it, it's like the little flowery stuff it's like dude just go with black uniforms like try the oval on a basketball like let's really go nuts like try some really wild like stuff like i i'd be so cool with that and just see them you know, try that. Maybe a different court design. I know I'm getting way off the rails here, but like that. I the well, aren't they going to have like sponsors sponsorships yeah. on the court this year for the first year potentially? I, th I thought Are I read they? that. I think so. They 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 solicited. We got an email a couple of months ago. They were soliciting like business opportunities for to get a name on the court. So I think they're at least open to that. I mean, I'd be. I, I love the the center court design is iconic, but like you could change that up every so often. Like have the block eye, have Indiana, you know, spray paint it across or something. Then kind of like, you know, maybe you do candy stripes down the lane or something. I, I, I think we need to be open to some of those changes. The other two things I would say, this is a real minor one. It's a shout out to my buddy Tom, who's been saying this for years. Um, 
the the under eight flag timeout is really cool. Uh, I think they they need to move it to the under four minute timeout. It's just it is it's always been something that the fans get hyped up for and they're kind of like pumped and then it's like all right we still got seven minutes a game and then it's like kind of like it feels like the energy dies down. Like I've always I agree with my buddy Tom. Like I think that should go at the under four timeout and then it's like maybe you stand for the rest of the game and that becomes a thing where like this pumps us up and then we're just going to own it for the last four minutes. And then I would also say, you know, they've done some renovations. They can keep it for a while, but I I don't think the idea of building a new stadium should be off the table either. I think Assembly Hall is a unique environment. It's a really cool environment. I think the the sound is I like that it's different than all the other places, but I don't think that we have to I, I I'm always open for a discussion of a new arena. As long as it's not something like funny, let's bash on Ohio State a little more. An arena like that seems very like the Value City Arena just seems boring and antiseptic and kind of like doesn't have any character. Like maybe build a I don't want to say a replica, but something unique like Assembly Hall. Maybe have some more wooden bleachers, but build it in a way where it's easy to get in and out of. There's more concession. There's a little more you know luxury suite options. Um, I I'm I'm not anti. Let's look for a new arena as well. So I'm. Th- those are some of the things that I would look to change as well, but I think we're pretty much in line with the, the two main ones that we had. Would you have a problem if it was something like the field house, but a little bit smaller, like Gamebridge? No, I think Gamebridge is a great place to watch a game. I love it. Oh, I love going there. I will rephrase. Gamebridge is a great place to watch a game. If you're in the low level or the mid level, this is sounding like, you know, <laughs> yeah, but it's not like the upper, it's not like the upper level in assembly hall is great right now. No, no, you're, no, you're right. Gamebridge is better. The upper level in Gamebridge is can be rough, um, but I think upper levels in all stadiums suck. And to your point, the upper level in Assembly Hall is is really rough, and the balcony is like a whole nother level of of seats. And that's that's something that always bugs me when people, you know, Memorial Stadium is different. There's a lot of good views, and even the high level in football is okay. And like Memorial Stadium is a pretty pretty intimate area or an intimate arena. People who don't like who are like always bitching about man the students aren't showing up in the balconies or we're not filling the balconies assembly hall i'm always like have you sat, have you ever sat up there have you sat up there because i've been there a lot as a student and like they suck like they are awful seats if you're even slightly drunk of which most students probably are like i'm worried i'm just you know i'm i was worried i was going to just completely go over the edge and just fall down those stairs like it is it's a rough hang up there um and even this you know the the seats up in the upper corners I used to. I remember going to games with Galen. We had to bring notebooks because the small scoreboards you couldn't see the scoreboards in some of the corners of Assembly Hall. They've now made the scoreboards bigger. They have some TVs and stuff up there, but those there's those corner seats where you feel like you're in a different arena because you can't see anything on the other side, and it's just you feel like you're in this little cocoon of stuff. So, I mean, I, I would always use that as my argument to people who are just and I, I love Assembly Hall. It's a Totally one of a one of one place, but it isn't the best basketball viewing experience, and you're always going to have trouble filling those four to five thousand really bad seats if unless the team is just like absolutely elite. Yeah, I think if you built a new stadium too, you'd probably maybe want to go a little bit smaller, right? Yeah. In terms of the seats, I know Louisville built this the Yum Center, and I know they've had some terrible teams the last couple of years, but even some of those years, I think they've it's like twenty one or twenty two thousand. Even when they've been good, they have a hard time filling that. I know Assembly Hall is not that big, but maybe you build it with 15 or 16 instead of, what, 17 or something, make it a little bit smaller. When uh, you can read that. Near- it, Let's go, too. Like, that, that's, that's something exactly. Would- like, ha- ha- have the students all on one side, like, down close to, like, make it a little bit more of an intimidating atmosphere. I'm not saying – I mean, I've been to a lot of the Big Ten venues, and Assembly Hall, when it's on fire, is as intimidating as it gets. It's like Mackey and Assembly, to me, are – like right, like in terms of the noise and how loud it can get, are one A, one B, however you want to put them. But when things aren't going so well and the students maybe aren't as enthused, there there can be times too where it's just not as lively. And I think if you can do something to kind of get people a little bit closer to the action and get, uh, I'm not saying the students aren't well represented now because they've got a ton of seats. And in terms of the seats allotted, right. it's as much as anybody in the country. But like align them in such a way to where they're making a little bit more of an impact. Like you could put them like down around the court in a new place. And then you 
still give the people who are your season ticket holders and have a lot of skin in the game really good seats uh you know in the lower level too so yeah, no, I, I agree. All, all, all hypotheticals that we probably don't have to worry about for a long yeah, time. Yeah, none of it's going to happen. But I mean, you, you see at Memorial Stadium, they changed the student section seating this year and they they put them kind of wrapped around the back end zone or the north end zone, I guess. And it, it has really made a difference. Like, it's amazing. Just the same number of students just in a different different setup has really changed the vibe and the sounds of that place. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's too bad the students have lost a lot of the good seats they used to have uh, in assembly hall, but it's, it's, it's money. It's, you know, and it's, it's, it's what they got to do. It's just, it is the realities of the, of the new world. Absolutely. Um, all right. Any final thoughts on this coming se- season? I mean, we did most of it already. This has been a fun retrospective, but do you, are you, um, since we last talked, are you any more or less excited for this upcoming season? I'm, I'm just as excited as I was before. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm just excited to see, Miles Rice in particular, because I think since we talked, maybe maybe I'd already gone to IU's Media Day. I don't remember exactly the date. It was a couple weeks ago, so maybe IU's Media Day had already taken place, but I'm not sure how much I talked about this, but he was the guy at Media Day that I was super impressed with, just his demeanor and the way he presented himself just in terms of taking on that leadership mantle and the fact that they took him to big 10 media day in Chicago. And I believe he's one of the captains for this year's team. That tells me a lot about it, just how he's being viewed internally. And he also plays the most important position on the team. In my opinion, when was the last time I, you had a great point guard, you look back, it's what, I mean, Huchifino there for that, that year was kind of a combo guard, but right. you look Probably at Yogi. A, Yogi, right? So yeah. everyone is talking about Balo and, Renew and Mbako and Balo got the, I think the preseason first team, all big 10 honor. Uh, To me, I'm looking at miles rice and saying, if he can be the player that he was last year at Washington state, which was an all pac 12 first team performer, the pac 12 freshman of the year and build on that. I think it makes Indiana, you know, look at what the point guard play was last year. And this is nothing against Gabe cups, but he even admitted to us that at media day, when we talked to him that he struggled last season and has a lot of work to do to, to kind of, get himself to where he wants to be as a player. And I think Indiana really shored up its guard pl- guard play and couple that with what should be a really good front court. And I think there's no reason that this team can't be competing near the top of the Big Ten. When you're seeing the, the projections come in, I mean, we're it's like us and Purdue, one, two, one, two, kind of that's that seems to be the the consensus. And the Purdue thing, it, it feels like that's more just on inertia and you know what they've done in the past and just kind of giving it on very good confidence, you know, very good reason, but kind of just being like, all right, well, Painter does this every year, so we'll do it again with this group. Um, so, you know, it, it does feel like we have a real shot to be in that top three. Yeah, that's why I picked Purdue in part was just because I've seen it before, right? right. I mean, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to take away from what they've done now over a sustained period i remember those teams that he had like the the two years where indiana was really good with cream and they just beat the doors off purdue yep uh there was like a game in a uh, mackey i remember going to it was like 97 to 60 or something crazy like that and i think since then painter has figured out like what he wants to do from a program perspective and how he wants to build his teams and i think the Ceiling some years may not be as high as some of the other programs in the Big Ten, but the floor I think you pretty know what you're gonna pretty much know what you're gonna get, which is gonna be a solid competitive team. And there's just so many question marks with a lot of these other Big Ten teams, like UCLA. Yeah. They were really bad last year, but they they really upgraded via the portal. Some people have picked them. Uh, Oregon's another team that I think a lot of people are high on coming over from the Pac-12, but we haven't seen these teams as, as up close and not as familiar. A lot of the, the people from the media picking these teams, same thing with Illinois. I think that's kind of more of a pick for Brad Underwood too, because look at, I think they have two or three scholarship players left from right. last year's elite eight team. And so what are you basing a projection on for them? You're basing it on the fact that you, you trust Brad Underwood to put together a team. It's kind of the same thing with painter, same thing with Izzo. How long have we given him the benefit of the doubt? And he's, underperformed now for several seasons in a row i think this year's big 10 race is going to be fascinating from the perspective of there's a lot of really solid teams i don't know that there's a dominant one and we had that last year with purdue i think it was a foregone conclusion that purdue was going to win the league this year i picked purdue to win the league but if you ask me if i'd 
pick Purdue or the field, I'm taking the field. So yeah, that's kind of that where I'm sense. at with it. Well, Alex, we've gone over an hour. We, we gave you the time. Um, dude, it's been great talking to you. This is always fun. Uh, I like kind of doing doing something different than just a normal preview. But uh, let's try and get together before maybe the end of the season and we do a uh, little pre, uh, you know, postseason preview. Hopefully, we're, we're looking at a uh, protected NCAA seed and we have uh, some fun discussions with that. That'd be nice. Thanks for having me, as always. Like I said, you all do a great job with uh, Crimson Cast. I look forward to uh, listening to whatever the next episode is over there. We got some football coming up, but no, you guys, I, I look at inside the hall as the gold standard. So it's uh, it's awesome having you on. I appreciate it. And uh, thank everybody for listening. And uh, until next time, this is Scott for Crimson Cast signing off.